Good morning. My name is Colleen Chen, and I teach patent law at Arthur <coughs> Law School. And we're going to, on our panel, address issues in ITC enforcement. So for some of you may be asking, what is the ITC, and why are we devoting a whole session to it? For those of you who haven't had the pleasure of suing or being sued there, you're lucky to have a good panel of people who have experience with the venue, fortunately or unfortunately, and will be addressing these issues. So I'm going to talk about, introduce our panelists, and then we will get into our discussion. So we'll start with Stephanie Schomburg, a partner at Wilson Sonsini. She specializes in patent litigation and focuses in particular on the ITC. Interestingly, she says on her website, a lot of lawyers will say, well, we, we represent both sides. She makes it clear that she mostly does defense work and defending companies from competitors and NPEs, but will, um, if the circumstances are right, also initiate lawsuits. She was named one of the top 20 under 40 attorneys in California and also is one of the top 75 litigators in California by the Daily Journal in 2011. After her, Ben Hattenbag, a partner at Irel and Manella, and a member of the firm's executive committee will be talking. He also specializes in the trial of patent litigation matters and is currently involved in many ITC investigations, both on the respondent and the complainant side. The important case of expansion, which came out last year, affirming that the federal circuit, by the federal circuit, that the ITC can and should issue exclusion orders without consideration of the eBay factors, that was Ben. Paul Roeder from uh, um, Paul Roeder from HP, where he's VP and Associate General Counsel, manages all IP litigation and disputes for HP, and frequently publishes on patent reform topics. His company makes many products, many which have been attacked in the ITC. ITC HP also frequently files complaints there. And finally, we have Neil Chatterjee, partner of partner co-chair of Oric's IP litigation practice. Since he didn't provide any slides for this panel, he has been designated as the heckler of the rest of us. And he's such a valiant insider that he was represented in the movie The Social Network by an actor, Cy, as Mark Zuckerberg's lawyer. I'm the lone non-practicing entity on this panel, that is to say I am an academic who writes in this area and I'll be offering my opinions as well. So be warned, there will be name calling, NP, troll, heckler, as we go forward. So before we go into the, kind of the specific subtopics with the ITC, I want to talk about some of the rumors we've all heard about the ITC. That it's an alternative venue to the district court for patent infringement, it's fast, it follows its own rules, you can still get an injunction there, and it's a neutral haven. So to queue up our discussion, I want to address, are these rumors actually true? Mark Lemley and I are writing a paper right now on the ITC, and so we have good access to some data that can address these rumors. So the first issue, can it, you get an injunction in the IDC? The question is yes, and yes, it is easier to get one there than in district court, across the board. District courts now are awarding injunctions at about a rate of 75%. In the IDC, the rate is still close to 100. Particularly, this is a discrepancy if you are a troll, and I will use that term in this context, here to refer to companies that primarily use their patents for assertion and litigation rather than transfer or commercialization of technology. It is a contested term. But there you see that in many, very few cases, actually where the injunction was contested, there's only one case where a troll was able to get a injunction post eBay. The other cases that this 26% represents were cases where the other side did not object to the injunction rate. So it should be even lower than this real 26%. But if you compare that to the injunction rate in the IDC, you see a pretty stark difference. Other rules in the district court that apply there do not also apply in the ITC. One in particular is the new joinder rules that have come out with the AIA, which limit the number of defendants that can be brought to ones that fit a specific definition. We've seen a decline in the number of defendants per NP suit in the district court as a result I would say of these changes, of course, you know, we could say maybe it just happened to change this way, but I, I, you know, the sense is that this really has changed practice. The AAA affects practice in district courts in terms of procedure. It does not apply to the ITC, where you see consistent filing in terms of the number of respondents that are named. So finally, the contention that it's a troll haven. Is this an issue? Is this really the case? Well, using data from RPX, which has uh, done troll designations here, they've counted the number of NPE suits, and I think they've used that term generously in terms of including individuals, 
companies that do research, but that primarily have a licensing business model. When you look at the numbers there, though, you see that there ha indeed have been a, quite a rise in NPE suits, depending on how you measure it, to the point now where a quarter of the cases in the IDC are brought by NPEs, and that accounts for 50% of the respondents. So that, with that background, we're going to queue up the discussion, and we'll be moving to a discussion of the particular areas in the ITC. And I'll start, start with Stephanie. One way that the ITC is very different than the district court is that the ITC requires complainants to have a domestic industry. Who deserves to be in the ITC? Well, I'm going to give a little bit of a long answer to that question to explain kind of how I think we got to where we are today. Um, it's appropriate to begin our discussion today with domestic industry because in a global economy where just about every U.S. company is importing a product or product components, domestic industry remains the you know, lone gatekeeper to preventing the ITC from becoming what the legislative history says that it should not be, which is just another venue for patent litigation. Um, and let's see, the ITC, you know, I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind as you're talking about domestic industry and about the ITC is that 337 is a trade statute. It's not a patent statute and it allows the ITC to extend an extremely powerful remedy in the customs exclusion order to protect domestic industries against infringing imported goods. I think that backdrop is, is very, very important to keep in mind, the fact that it's a trade statute. It's also important, I think, to keep in mind what the ITC is not. The ITC has grown in popularity um, just exponentially year over year. Um, this last year they instituted 70 investigations and while the quantity of investigations is way, way up, the type of investigations has also changed a lot. Um, you'll see here that 33% of ITC complainants in the last year, well actually just a portion of last year, were foreign. 18% um, didn't even claim to practice the patent that they were asserting in the ITC. And um, you know, I, I'd maintain, in answer to Colleen's question, you know, that the ITC is not a um, end run around district courts, you know, eBay requirements. It's, it should not be just a more effective forum for patent holdup. Um, it, it should not be an end run around you know, the AIA. It should not be an end run around standards obligations, nor should it be an end run around district court backlog and the length of proceedings these days in a lot of district courts. The ITC is, again, you know, a trade statute that focuses on domestic industries and the protection of domestic industries, and, um, you know, and the statute focuses on articles. Um, so go to the, the legislative history and kind of say, you know, how did, how did we get here? In 1988, Congress felt the need to amend Section 337 to expand domestic industry so that organizations that did not have the resources to manufacture products on their own, and in the legislative history, it's, that's namely universities and startups who license their technology, their patents, to manufacturers who may or may not produce the products domestically, um, could avail themselves of the remedy in the ITC. But the focus has always been on articles, and the legislative history for 337 makes clear that Congress did not intend for the ITC to morph into an intellectual property forum and intended the domestic industry requirement to be this stringent gatekeeper such that there would not be excessive use of the ITC, which you know I, I'd maintain, and again, you know I have to say, is, some of my partners and clients who might have different views are in the room, that these are my, these are my personal opinions. Um, I happen to think that they're right. Um, but you know, the, the, that is precisely what the ITC is, is not supposed to be. So moving along to recent interpretations and um, you know, the, the rise of MPEs, um, MPE litigation has somewhat forced the issue as to how effective this gatekeeping ability of the domestic industry requirement actually is. And the commission's been grappling with things like, do litigation expenses count as exploitation of a patent for the purposes of domestic industry? In coaxial cables, there's a few kind of seminal commission cases that I'll just introduce for the purposes of our future discussion here. Coaxial cables is a case that looked at the extent to which litigation expenses would count towards domestic industry. In coaxial cables, the commission found that there was not a domestic industry. and you know, essentially acknowledged that there's a difference between revenue-driven licensing and production-driven licensing, but then also found that under the current 
statute, they believe they have to look at both. So under some circumstances, the commission does seem willing to consider litigation expenses as long as they have a sufficient nexus to the asserted patent um, as part of domestic industry. I'd, I'd maintain that, that that is incorrect. Later on, the commission in navigation devices, I, I think, gave some hope that they're going to be a little more true to the legislative history and to the statute by saying that they plan to give revenue-driven licensing less weight than production-driven licensing, particularly in view of the legislative history that focuses on the promotion of articles that practice the patent. So the, the FTC would agree with that later interpretation by the commission. The FTC would go so far as to recommend that the commission not focus on ex post licensing activity at all, but only allow ex ante licensing activity to count towards domestic industry. And the way that the FTC distinguishes the two is that ex ante licensing is to promote the use of patented technology in new articles and products. And ex post licensing is more like what they call a rent or a tax on innovation. The, that is a long way of getting a lot around to my answer to Colleen's question, which is who can be in the ITC. My response to that is that those who can be in the ITC are those that meet the technical prong of domestic industry. The statute itself, I think, allows the commission to follow the FTC's recommendations and to only allow those complainants who satisfy the technical prong of domestic industry and are actually promoting an article into the ITC as a complainant that exploitation has to be substantial as it relates to the industry in question and litigation activity relating to the enforcement of a single patent is unlikely to be substantial as it relates to an entire industry that it is going against. And, and, and thirdly, it has to be exploitive as that term is used in the legislative history. And exploitive in the legislative history makes very, very clear that it is directed towards the promotion of new articles in commerce and new domestic industries as opposed to the taxing of those that already exist. So I know from prior discussions with these guys that there are some people on this panel who vehemently agree with me as to who should be in the ITC. I think the ITC has a place, but I think it's a much narrower place than some are currently advocating and um, you know, be interested to open it up for discussion. There are some who agree with me on this panel and, and will probably parrot a lot of what I said and there are others who I hope will disagree with me and give us a good debate. I'll, I'll, I'll go first being the designated heckler. Um, uh, uh, in some ways I agree, in some ways I disagree. I think the, the fundamental issue um, of the ITC is a separation of powers question and one of the things that underlies some of the things that, 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 that somebody was talking about is that what the ITC statute does is it, 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 the ITC is not an Article III court. It is an agency of uh, the president and it is a delegation of authority uh, that Congress has legislated to take power out of the hands of a federal court if a stay is issued and put it into the hands of an executive branch. Um, and that's an important thing uh, just as a starting point because interpretation of this statute today has mostly been the agency deciding the scope of its own jurisdiction in the sense that all of the domestic industry statutes when we talk about what it is, the agency is deciding whether or not they choose to exercise authority uh, of the ITC to allow people into the court for purposes of domestic uh, industry. Domestic industry is, is the door people have to walk through to get in. Um, going to that, I think that, that there is a, a, a key issue on the domestic industry requirement. There is authority in the ITC, although the opinions are often shrouded in secrecy because they redact huge chunks of it because of a very protective uh, 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 view of protective orders in that proceeding that says, paying for lawyers uh, to litigate patents and hiring staff to license patents um, is a domestic industry in, in and of itself. The good news is, is that gives us all job protection. Um, the, the bad news is, is it seems like uh, creating a litigation machine um, in and of itself being a basis to establish a, a, an executive branch jurisdiction seems like an extraordinary thing to me. And it, it really allows the ITC to move itself from being what is a, a court to protect trade into a court to protect patents. Um, 
and, and I, I have a real significant issue with that. Um, there was a, a federal circuit appeal on October of last year. Uh, it was the Rambus appeal, which many people followed. Um, and the federal circuit has not said a whole lot beyond the Mezzalunga case and some older cases um, evaluating what is the scope of the jurisdiction. Right now it's the ITC deciding for itself. And in many cases the opinions will be somewhat uh, inconsistent. It's kind of like Mark's description of, of the definition of the term A. Um, the, the, the Federal Circuit, um, in the majority opinion in Mezzalunga, says it's a court of trade. In the, in the minority opinion, it says um, it, it can be a court to protect patents. Um, but the Federal Circuit authority is relatively limited. In the hearing, uh, Judge Clevenger, uh, in the Rambus hearing, Judge Clevenger actually, uh, within himself, had two separate views of what the domestic industry requirement was. The ITC came into that hearing. Um, and when you go on appeal out of the federal, uh, out of the ITC, it's actually a, 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 the losing party versus the ITC, and then the prevailing party actually intervenes. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different procedure than what you'll see in a district court. And the ITC took the position that under agency deference rules, they could have two opinions involving the exact same body of facts that come to wildly different uh, conclusions and even though they were the exact same set of facts coming to different legal conclusions the Federal Circuit could not second-guess that decision this was actually the argument that they made because of agency deference rules um, Judge Clevenger didn't really like that answer and he said it seems to me that that people uh, should have guidance as to when they can and cannot use the ITC as a tool um, and then he made, I, I actually uh, 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 got this quote um, uh, from the hearing that I thought was very interesting going to Colleen's point. Uh, Judge Clevenger said, what I'm going to say now and shouldn't say, the elephant in the room here, it seems to me that there are a number of litigants that are coming into your venue, that being the ITC, who are seeking an exclusion order which functions as an injunction who would be unable to do so if they were in a U.S. district court under eBay. So it strikes me that the commission is now greeting a lot of types of cases in which you're able to give the relief that the U.S. Supreme Court said you shouldn't be given in a U.S. District Court case. So even the Federal Circuit is now getting concerned about the level of authority granted to an executive branch under the, 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 the ITC statute. Now Judge Clevenger's answer to that uh, on the one hand was to say, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll require a domestic production requirement under this licensing prong Stephanie talked about, which is um, if you're going to license a patent and go into the ITC, you have to license some U.S. entity to actually make the stuff and have them actually making stuff because it makes it more of a trade issue because you're creating American jobs. But then on, uh, on the reply argument, um, uh, when uh, one of my colleagues actually stood up and, 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 and said, I kind of like your idea, Judge Clevenger. Uh, Judge Clevenger then jumped all over him and said, I don't think my idea was good at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and he gave the following quote. Say, for example, the license for $50 million to a particular licensee, and it's a single patent license. So the patent is named, and somebody pays 50 million bucks for it and writes down, I'm paying 50 million bucks so that I can practice that patent. But there's no evidence that they ever used it. They decided to use the patent for defensive reasons. And, and you would bar, and he was using the example of a university, and you would bar that university from access to 337? So he was questioning the own theory that he put forward. Um, I, uh, uh, the, one of the most interesting things about this is um, that appeal uh, that NVIDIA raised, uh, the case settled. Um, and, uh, and there's, uh, uh, on the separation of powers fronts, there's now a battle going on because there are subsequent litigations involving different parties, whether, uh, whether the federal circuit has the authority to issue an opinion uh, uh, coming out of an agency decision um, uh, and, and whether the case or controversy requirement, at some level this is the issue, uh, whether the case or controversy requirement applies to review of an agency uh, opinion coming out that, 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 that still is a very a real and live controversy for others that the agency is reviewing. Um, so I mean, I think, I think your answer then is to say, if 
I can kind of restate it, that perhaps greater oversight by the federal circuit could clarify the domestic industry. And I guess I think that based on the statute itself, the problem is the statute itself is fairly broad as well as the, as the legislative history. So I'm not sure unless the federal circuit really takes a position and wants to create law here beyond what's with, or what is already in the domestic industry history and the statute that they're going to be that much more helpful. Yeah, and the, and the problem with that is is the Kyocera um, opinion, uh, not, not, not the one involving uh, naming customer respondents, but rather the jurisdictional question. Because this issue only gets appealed uh, to the federal circuit after the injunction has issued, uh, if you lose. Um, and, and, and those consequences are so dire, it's hard to get the review of the domestic industry requirement because the cases will often get resolved because of the consequences. We just have a couple more minutes on this, but I want to make sure that Ben and Paul have a chance to chime in if they want to on domestic industry. Sure. Well, I, I, uh, I actually did have a question for uh, Stephanie, and, and without advocating that the domestic industry requirement should be expanded or, or narrowed in one way or the other, there, there is one respect in which I think um, the ITC might be able to improve things, and that, that's just in providing clarity as to its scope. And so. Just to give you a couple examples, one of the things Neil said a moment ago <coughs> is that if one spends money on lawyers, that counts towards the domestic industry. And to put a little bit of a finer point on it, what the ITC said in the coaxial cables case is if you spend money on lawyers for purposes of licensing, not litigation that's not for the purposes of licensing, that could count. Um, I have a great difficulty trying to um, determine after the fact, whether money spent on lawyers was really just for licensing or might have also been for litigation and when litigation is for the purposes of licensing or some other purpose. It's sort of difficult to tell after the fact. And then also just on a, on a larger level, the standard itself is inherently vague. It's a substantial investment. And to my knowledge, the ITC has never said that means $50,000 or $100,000 a patent. And so, uh, Stephanie, I don't know if you have thoughts on ways in which they could provide greater clarity so that people won't be scratching their heads wondering if they have a domestic industry or not before they file suit and find out. Yes, sir. I know Paul has thoughts on this as well. It'd be a perfect question for Paul. But, um, you know, I, I actually do. Um, you know, in terms of substantiality, I absolutely think that it needs to be evaluated in relation to the industry that is being being attacked or being sued in the ITC as opposed to, you know, is $50,000 significant for this person who just bought a patent, you know, and wants to enforce it in the ITC. I think that they need to be taking um, discovery and allowing um, development of a record on the actual industry in question. And in terms of the litigation expenses, I mean, the ITC gave three criteria. I agree with you. They're all, you know, clear as mud. They basically said it needs to have a nexus to the patent at issue, it needs to have a nexus to licensing, and it needs to have a nexus to the United States. So, you know, how, how somebody can determine whether or not they've engaged in substantial licensing or enough litigation activity, you know, and whether that litigation activity, you know, was desirous of a licensing result um, to determine whether or not they have a uh, domestic industry is something that, that I can't answer based on coaxial cables. What I can tell you is that my view on it is that the ITC is, is incorrect, and unless it has a nexus to an actual article in commerce that that complainant is promoting, and it satisfies the technical prong, just like practicing entities have to satisfy the technical prong. You know, they, sh they shouldn't be there. Um, and I think that actually leads me to just an absurdity in the interpretation that, that to me is, is one of the most compelling things, which is that if you allow litigation activity, the way that Neil described, to count as you know, your substantial investment for domestic industry, it becomes substantially easier for non-practicing entities to assert them, their patents in the ITC than it is for practicing entities. I mean, I just represented a complainant on a case relating to GFCIs, where there were a bunch of infringing, um, you know, essentially knockoffs coming in from overseas. And, um, you know, we had to go through the entire infringement analysis for our entire line of GFCIs and tie it to the patents and suit. There's nothing in the legislative <coughs> history that suggests it should be okay for it to be harder for a practicing entity to be in the ITC than a non practicing entity. But the case law so far on this point is not clear. Right. Well, yeah, I, I actually think it's the, the case law supports. NPEs that are just licensing one or two patents, it makes it easier for them to go oh, yeah, to the ITC. Oh, because they don't have the portfolio licensing problem. Yeah. Right. right. It, Make sure Paul gets a word and well, we need to move on beyond domestic I mean, industry. I would disagree with Colleen and, 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 and say that the statute doesn't provide sufficient guidance for the federal circuit to fix this. I mean, if HP goes in under, under 3C, 
substantial investment in engineering and research and development in order to stop people who are cloning our products. We have to satisfy the technical prong to the last Great. claim and element. I've, I've written that as well. The yeah, technical but, prong needs to be and upheld. So, and so, we're, so we're good to go. I mean, you need to have a, you, if you're going to go in there on licensing, you need to show that you license folks. To, uh, so what happens know, if HP buys a patent and asserts it in the ITC? Are you satisfying the domestic industry? No. Yeah. Okay, and so you would give up your jurisdiction then as well? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I agree. Technical <coughs> problems should be applied fairly across the board. And I think that fixes the problem. The problem hasn't been significant and substantial. I mean, we, you know, that hasn't been where the, uh, the ITC has gotten screwed up. It's gotten screwed up in some notion that you can look at this statute which says relating to articles, and it isn't practicing the patent, it's protected by the patents. The notion of it could say practicing, but it doesn't. It says protected. Because the notion is if you're in there on licensing, you've got an invention, you went to someone and said, hey, I got this awesome invention, but it's protected by my patent. Do you want to, I want to exploit it and I want you to manufacture it. Your item, your item will be protected by my patent. The notion isn't that HP goes out and buys a patent and says, hey, Canon, guess what? I just bought a patent. And Canon says, well, you know, okay, I'll give you some money. Uh, and, and that's an article protected by the patent. That, that, that's not protected by the patent. That's just, you know, it may practice it, it may arguably practice it, but that's not articles protected by the patent. So it strikes me that there's no problem with the statute. It's just that somehow the ITC decided that the last two words of C don't have the same requirements as all the rest of C or B or A, with no basis whatsoever in the structure of the statute. Right, I agree, and I've written again that the technical prong should apply. Um, I do think on the economic prong, it's more muddy. Sure. And uh, I think that's kind of where we'll leave it with now, the new, next topic. So and you folks are also kind of becoming engaged. I do encourage you to come down. We can try to make each of these different topics ones that we can get questions from the audience. Um, Neil, I think you started to address it already, but a lot of district ITC cases have a short counterpart. Do we really need the ITC? What do you think? So, um, you know, it, when you're dealing with these, you know, with, with really complicated IP litigations, right, you're, you're going to have a district court action. You very possibly, if there's importation involved, it's hard, typically a hardware patent case, not a software patent case. Could be uh, various kinds of biotech. You could have this ITC action. Uh, the district court action will often get stayed in favor of the ITC action. And then you have this wonderful place called uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, where people will seek re-examinations. Um, and uh, you can easily have three different fora, um, and potentially the FTC, depending on the nature of the case, all evaluating the same patent and the relevance of that patent to a particular set of commercial activities. Um, uh, the one thing we got to love about the government is efficiency. Um, because uh, the ITC uh, will take precedence over the district court uh, and by statute. Uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and uh, the ITC uh, generally will not give each other um, a lot of deference, um, even though they can have simultaneous uh, activities going on involving the validity of uh, the patent. And the USPTO could invalidate a patent, but because of the time it takes to get to resolution of whether the patent's valid or not, the ITC can decide that the patent uh, is valid and infringed, disregard uh, even the Board of Patent Appeals and Interference's opinion, and issue an exclusion order based upon it. Um, so the short answer to the question is, um, maybe the ITC is required, but not in its current form. Um, I think the ITC is currently configured in a way to create um, a lot more problems and leverage in a way that is totally counterproductive to what the spirit of its authority grant is. Um, you also have, uh, and we haven't talked about this yet, you have this very odd procedure. When, when, when we here as litigants go into a courtroom, there are two people that are involved, a plaintiff and a defendant. In the ITC, they call it a complainant and respondent. Um, the government, uh, uh, the executive branch, actually has two people in the ITC. They have the judge, and then they also have someone called a staff attorney in the ITC that is also working under the auspices of the president and isn't really a law clerk to the judge, but is a separate advocate that's going into the proceeding to express their own uh, point of view. Um, and in theory, they're supposed to be advocating for the public interest. Um, this not only is the, the tripartite nature of IP disputes um, a problem, this breeds even further inefficiencies and really doesn't seem to procure um, any incremental benefit as far as I can tell 
Um, I, I like them. They're nice people. Some of them are pretty smart. But um, and, 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 and maybe people can go in and say we're creating American jobs, so that's a good thing. But, um, but the overall utility, I'm, not, I'm unaware of any other you know, proceed, proceeding where uh, you, you have these three separate stakeholders and one of the stakeholders is not clearly defined. Um, so if we're to have the ITC and we are to protect trade, I think we have to do a significant rejiggering of the process to make it an, a more efficient and more fair process, acknowledging the different uh, venues that people are litigating these things in. Do you think that requires a statutory change? I do. I do. Um, I, you know, um, I, I don't think getting rid of the staff attorneys, if that's the right decision, <laughs> it requires a statutory right. change. But yeah, I mean, they're changing their roles as we speak. You know, there's some investigations right. that they're opting out of. They don't have the budget for yeah. it. I mean, you know, um, but you know, the discovery free for all, the the unlikely nature of, of, of doing any summary judgment, the absence of misjoinder, um, the unlikely the unlikely ability to get early markments, um, the the absence of any meaningful ca case management. I just wrote all these down. The relaxed evidentiary rules, where um, you you do not hearsay is entirely allowed. Um, in in the ITC and and maybe that's okay maybe that's not but um, but you know all of these issues are fundamental due process issues that our clients typically expect when we go into a courtroom uh, in the ITC those are all kind of taken as a suggestion and then tossed aside and the CFR gives authority for the ITC to do that um, I, 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 it can be crushing the discovery costs alone. Well, but in my experience, that's one of the reasons why it actually can be very efficient and helpful to have staff attorneys involved. And it may be that, in your experience, your staff attorneys came from the uh, bottom of the staff attorney barrel. Um, and I think <laughs> the um, extent to which they can be helpful in moving the process along, it depends on the individual, um, the person who's participating. But um, oftentimes... I have yet to see a staff attorney say we should curtail discovery on an issue. Well, I, I, I think I regularly see staff attorneys um, intervene when the parties have substantial disputes that are making discovery either impossible or highly inefficient. And they twist arms if necessary, or they try to make the parties behave in a more reasonable way um, that get things done more quickly without the need to bother the ALJ. Um, and I also think it's, it's helpful in, um, at, at trial in making sure that parties don't take wildly unsupported or unrealistic positions, that there can be a neutrally perceived third party to come in and, and help educate the judge. I think it's. It, in the I Northern District, they call that a magistrate judge. Well, and the, well, the problem is the staff attorneys don't have the resources to be educated themselves half the time. I mean, I have had some wonderful staff attorneys, some of whom are now leading that office. And while I agree that they can sometimes be a mediating effect, you know, in a contentious deposition or on a discovery committee call, <coughs> I don't think in the end they make a a bit of a difference, particularly with some of these new judges. Um, it used to be that you know some of the judges had reputations for following the staff attorney's recommendations, particularly on procedural issues. But you know, it, these days, I have to agree with Neil. They're really nice guys, and sometimes I really enjoy having them around, especially when they take my side on things. But um, all in all, I think it's, it's it's a wasteful proceeding. Well, I think it's difficult because we're proceeding, at least until recently, in an environment where there always was a staff attorney to 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 figure out what would have happened if there wasn't a staff attorney. And my Hypothesis is that in many cases there would be a significantly larger uh, number of protracted disputes in discovery and otherwise in the process that, that parties would be willing to, um, to create and maintain if there wasn't a staff attorney there to convince them to be reasonable. Let me, I'll go ahead. Well, um, it, so first, you know, on Neil's question, you know, I, I, I'm not aware that we really need statutory change. I think, I think the the statute, if the statute alone were followed on just on DI and public interest, you'd go back to sort of paradigmatic cases. I, I think there is a need for the ITC, and I think HP uses it in the exact way that it's meant to be, and that is there are non-US companies who we cannot get jurisdiction over, who are not practicing our patents. They're ripping off our IP. They're taking our products and they're cloning them. And they have no R&D expense. They have none of the expenses that we have. And so they can clone work that we spent millions of dollars to develop, ship it here for cheaper than us, and, and injure what is a substantial United States industry employing thousands of Americans to develop this product. The ITC is really, and, and, and furthermore, we're not trying to put a gun to their head to shake them down for money and to avoid what the United States Supreme Court has told us is the appropriate value of a patent. 
We're not trying to get an injunction where you couldn't get an injunction. We're not trying to get damages above what the United States Supreme Court and the Federal Circuit have told us. We're just trying to get these things kept out. And so we're willing to prove a real DI. We're willing to prove that it's in the public interest. And we don't have jurisdiction. So, so there's a genuine value to the ITC. Now, uh, unfortunately, that's, a, that's the, m the minuscule minority of cases that are being filed in the last six months. As to the staff attorney, I agree that I, 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 it is very inefficient. And I've had some very unhappy and unpleasant and pull your hair out experiences with the whole process. But in theory, this shouldn't be about a complainant and a respondent. It should be about the United States government. You go in and complain. You're the complainant saying, hey, United States government, there's a problem. It's not about me. It's not about my IP. It's about domestic industry in the United States, and it's about helping US trade. Would you investigate it? And the United States says, yeah, we will. It seems odd to me that you wouldn't have a United States investigative resource attached to that problem more than you'd have a complainant attorney. Yeah. Frankly, I can well, see, see a scenario where the complainant has to step back and say, all right, there it is. Help me out if you can. I, I don't get to go in there and argue that my patents, you know, that's not what we're here to do. It's the United States deciding, okay, we've got a trade problem here. What do we want to, what do we want to recommend to the U.S. Trade Rep, Congress, and the President? If the staff attorney was used as a regulatory enforcer in the way that the SEC right. would do something, I feel yeah. really differently about yeah, it. But, but, and, then, and, and then there's still only two parties fighting. Yeah. And, and what the client has to decide is are they willing to give up control to the regulator? Yeah. And, and, and I think that, you know, that's a fair set of questions. Let's get a question from the audience. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point with regard to the um, issue about Markman rulings. Indeed, I wanted to agree that you don't have the guarantee of uh, a Markman ruling coming out well in advance of an expert report that you do. For example, I'm on a case right now, and it's like there's a week apart when the, the Markman comes out and then the first expert report. <coughs> Not only that, there's the additional issue that the Markman could get overturned, at least in part, when uh, after the, when the final determination comes out. So you have to write an expert report not only within a week's time of this market coming out, but also you have to take into account all the possibilities of things that could go to overturn because of the things that were discussed during the market appearance. So it gets very complex for an expert to do a report in that kind of environment. And so it's you know, unfortunate, but just want to at least make that point. I didn't say you're fortunate to have gotten a Markman order at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, because, you know, we've gone through a number of ICC investigations where you have to put your expert report in under multiple alternative claim constructions. You have to put the expert testimony on at the hearing that way, and you don't actually find out what the rules of the game are until you get the initial determination. I mean, I do think the new judges are a little bit more open-minded about having Markman hearings, and, you know, hopefully they'll realize that they need to do it on a reasonable schedule and early enough in the case to make it useful. Yeah, although they, th there are a number that also kind of take the view, and you know, the Federal Circuit has endorsed this at some level, that knowing what the accused product is, is yeah. helpful at some level in, in doing claim construction. And there certainly are cases where the judges did a claim construction early in a case, all the expert reports were framed, and then on the initial and final determination, uh, they changed their claim construction, and then they punished the expert for not contemplating that they were going to change their claim construction. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the ALJs, they say that if they have eight cases or eight investigations, that they're about maxed out. Right now, there are about 12 investigations yeah. for ALJs. I mean, they're the hardest. I mean, they're very hardworking, the, the ALJs. I want to move on. Ben, uh, we talked a little bit in the discussion about Kyocera, and there's been the reference to that case before. Can you tell us a little bit more about why this case was such a big deal and what you've seen in terms of how it's impacted the practice? Sure. I think um, you know the question really at this point is whether it was a big deal. There was a, um, a lot of um, a lot of discussion of it when it first came out. But um, before I get into that, let me just let me just go over a little bit of background. Um, I'm not going to talk about general exclusion orders much. But it's a general exclusion order is one of the two principal remedies that um, complainants in the ITC seek. And basically, it, it allows them to exclude an entire class of goods. You describe the goods like <coughs> all cell phones or all smartphones or all DDR3, DRAM. And um, if you prevail, that's what the order um, will exclude absent uh, a license. And the reason why we're not going to talk about this much is they're very difficult to get. They're very rarely issued, um, less, far less than 10% of cases, and, and particularly in recent years, um, complainants have been uh, successful in, in getting a general exclusion order, a GEO. And one of the reasons for that is, is these additional requirements which we have up here on the board. They're just much more exacting than um, the requirements for an LEO, a limited exclusion order, which is the relief that um, most uh, complainants in the ITC are seeking. And when talking about 
ITC remedies um, with people, I generally think it's advisable to take a look at a sample uh, order, a sample exclusion order, um, and see, see how broad it is in some respects and how narrow it is in others. So I have here just some actual language so we can have a concrete uh, consideration of it. Um, it goes beyond uh, products just manufactured by the respondents in the case that were found to infringe. And over the last 20 years or so, until the Kyocera case came along, um, there used to be a lengthy um, debate in each and every case where an LEO was sought, or at least most of them, um, regarding the extent to which what's called downstream relief could also be obtained under the statute that provides for limited exclusion orders. And what downstream relief is, at a high level, it's, it's relief against parties who you have not named as respondents in the case, who are importing products that contain components that were found to infringe in the case. So as an example, um, let's take the Kyocera case. Um, Broadcom sues Qualcomm and says, some of your chips infringe our patents. And the ITC said, yeah, indeed, one of Broadcom's patents is infringed by a Qualcomm chip. Well, Broadcom turns around and says, OK, now that we've established that Qualcomm's chips infringe, ITC, I'd like you to exclude from importation into the United States any products that include those chips. And so that would be virtually, uh, I don't know, a third or half of cell phones um, coming into the United States. And obviously, the manufacturers of those cell phones, who Broadcom chose not to name as respondents in the case, had a problem with that. Um, the case went up to the Federal Circuit. And on a, really what was a pure statutory interpretation uh, basis, decided that no longer can anyone obtain downstream relief under the limited exclusion order statute. Previously, there was a, a case called uh, the EPROMS case. Um, came out in 1989 that articulated nine factors that the ITC would balance in deciding whether to grant downstream relief. That's, for all practical purposes, now uh, out the window. And um, as you can imagine, um, that was a bit of a surprise to some people. It did um, arguably uh, create a, a fairly dramatic change in the nature of the relief that, that people could expect to get at the ITC if they were successful in proving infringement. Um, and in particular, I think that um, there were some changes that were expected. So I, I think there was an expectation that many plaintiffs just wouldn't go to the ITC any longer because the relief was curtailed in a way that, that was not any longer uh, helpful for them. There was an expectation that people would ask for and maybe receive a uh, much higher number, higher percentage of general exclusion orders under which you still can obtain downstream relief. And perhaps most significantly, there was an expectation that to deal with this ruling, the Kyocera ruling, as a practical matter, as a practical workaround, litigants would just name more parties. Uh, it's not downstream relief if the party is there before the ITC and their products were, uh, were found to infringe. And so um, just as, a, uh, as an example, here's a summary of a few of the cases that were filed shortly after Kyocera. And, and some of them have very large numbers of respondents. Um, sometimes the respondents are spread throughout an entire chain of commerce. It could be a manufacturer and an importer and a distributor and a wholesaler and a retailer. Um, and um, that's a good way of avoiding the problem of, uh, of um, the, that's raised by Kyocera. Uh, people were expecting, I think, this, this trend of large numbers of respondents being named to continue. It obviously makes the ITC process more expensive, um, less efficient, take longer in some cases. And sometimes the trials were a real nightmare. I mean, it was, uh, I, I've done trials where there were more attorneys in the court than we have people in this room right now. I mean, literally more than 100 attorneys. It's just a circus. Um, the good news is um, that there have been some statistical analyses done covering a wider period of time. And <coughs> the, um, the intelligence we have so far as of about a year ago is that none of the things that people were thinking were going to become real problems have actually uh, manifested as, as real problems. Um, the, there's been a slight increase in the average number of respondents per case, uh, but it's not really a statistically significant increase. Um, there, hasn't, there has not been a, a substantial increase in the number of GEOs that have issued. I know that between the time of Kyocera and the end of 2010, I don't think there was a single GEO issued um, in the ITC. And obviously, um, um, there has not been a, um, a departure of litigants 
from the ITC. People are still filing there and in increasing numbers. Although I think that one is more the result of uh, other factors. It's not really uh, so much dependent on the Kyocera decision. Thank you. Uh, it's just in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to Paul so that if there are any questions, we can kind of consolidate them. Um, but it's a very felt summary. And Paul, now we kind of move to this issue of, back to the issue of public interest. So we know the Federal Circuit has said that the ITC does not need to follow eBay. Uh, how does the ITC take into account its own public interest factors? Um, how should it? Well, there's certainly two answers to that. One is that it doesn't seem to at all right now. Uh, how should it? Uh, I think it should follow its own statute, which I think is, is fairly clear. I think, you know, the fa I think the public interest factors are, are, are pretty well kept secret about the ITC. There's this notion that if you win, you get an exclusion order, and in fact, you do 100% <laughs> of the time. But in fact, you know, 337D1 provides that they shall be excluded from entry unless, after considering the effect of such exclusion upon, and lists these four factors here, it finds that such articles should not be excluded. Uh, and I think within the context of what the ITC should be, this is an incredibly important part of the ITC's mandate. That's why it's in their statute. Um, you know, these factors go to, okay, you've, you've shown you have a domestic industry, you've shown that uh, someone's infringing your patent, but is it in the best interest of the public as a trade matter? This is a trade body, not, not, not you complainant. I'm sure complainant would like us to. That's terrific, good for you. We're not concerned about that. What we're concerned about are these factors. Uh, now, what's happened so far is, uh, one, the issue is very rarely raised, and, uh, and sometimes it's not an issue, um, but it is very rarely raised. If raised, the current practice is that there's this sort of overwhelming presumption in favor, which you don't see in the statute, other than the term unless. You know, somehow that, that creates some enormous presumption, but it doesn't say that in the statute. And then the public interest, the, the ITC has invented a public interest factor, which you don't see in the statute, um, which says uh, the, the public has a very strong interest in favor of patent enforcement. So we're starting off with the scale tipped heavily in one direction. That, it's not in the statute, it's not in the statute for a good reason. We have a place, it's called the United States District Court, which enforces patents for people. And that's not what we're trying to do here. And so the, the, you know, the ITC has just invented the, uh, its own public interest factor of patent enforcement. And the only factor that's in the statute that's really been paid any attention to is the public health and welfare. And that has been considered uh, first responders, national defense, you know, hospitals, as if that's the only interest that the United States public has in deciding whether to exclude infringing practice. Um, so the, the effect has been, I think, that when we've talked about this a lot before, that you, you basically invaded the, the judicial function by making this into an IP enforcement. Uh, mechanism and making that the, the test as opposed to a, a trade test. Uh, and you know, a couple of interesting decisions on the issue of sort of invading the judicial process. One, it's well settled that ITC decisions have no preclusive effect in federal court. Why is that? Because the federal courts have primary jurisdiction over the patent laws. I mean, and then secondly, there's a recent decision down in Texas about um, this automatic stay provision that district courts automatically are required to stay a case if it's in the ITC. Uh, and Judge, you can question that. So wait a minute. I don't see that in the Constitution that it can be uh, said that I have to stop my processes in favor in favor of administrative proceedings. So I think the effect of non-enforcement of PI has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, as Neil said, uh, an interesting question about invading our Article Three branch. Um, now, the rule changes in November, and I think these are great. I think the ITC had stepped up and said, look, we're going to start paying attention to this. There are a whole series, which I won't read them all, a whole series of little five-page briefs that folks can file, the public, the complainant, the respondent. You know, it goes back and forth, back and forth. So we've, we've at least, you know, the, the ITC has at least lifted this issue. Interestingly, you know, the ITC TLA opposed these rule changes, saying that, oh, well, we don't want to have five-page briefs on the public interest. That would slow the process down and make everything so expensive. It just struck me as amazing. And amazing, you know, that, that, that the bar that practices here, you know, oh, no, we can't have a five-page brief on this. And fundamental uh, function of the ITC. Yeah, and the solution was, was that we're just not going to read them. Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah, and, and they call for them, and, and you know, I mean, I, I agree completely. Um, so, but I'm going to race on here, um, and here's what the five-page well, statement. If you, sorry, if you, just to take a minute. Yeah. What, what do you think was prompting the ITC to implement these rule changes? They did it for a year. 
it doesn't look like they've really taken those statements into consideration yet, but why do you think they were pushed towards doing that? I'll yield to Stephanie, who uh, is... Maybe you were behind some of it. I don't know. I mean, if you know, if I had to say based on you know what little the commission shares about their thought processes, is that you know they were seeing public interest become a much bigger issue at the time of commission review, and so they were recognizing the fact that there's no record that's been developed before the ALJ, and that they could perhaps make better decisions if they had more information developed earlier on. Because it, it used to be that you didn't have any discovery on these topics during the actual investigation. Yeah, right. So in that regard, I think it's, it's helpful. I mean, I, I wish they would have gone one step further to maintain that if it's clearly not in the public interest to maintain the investigation, they don't have to wait and decide not to issue an exclusion order. They can terminate the investigation, which is a step they have not yet taken. Right. It seems to yeah. open up the possibility, which would be a pretty encouraging. And it almost seems analogous to the kind of idea of reverse bifurcation damages assessment early on in a trial. You know, what is just really at stake here? And we can maybe you know, avoid this if there's really no exclusion order to yeah. be forthcoming. This this is an area where I do think legislative change could make sense because I actually think the public interest evaluation should be a standing requirement. Yeah, I think so too. Um, and and you know, I, my cynical view of why this you know five-page requirement was put in place was because they were getting a lot of heat for not factoring in the public interest, and and so they said let's make a rule that makes people submit something uh, so people will think we're reading it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can see the cases that have gone forward where you've got, you know, all automobiles in the United, will be excluded from the United States <laughs> that have GPS in them, granted. Only GPS enabled automobiles will be excluded from the United States from Ford and GM based on a Swiss investor who bought a patent and, and, and filed in the ITC. You know, it's like, oh, okay. You, know, you, get, you get 55 page letters come in and it's like, oh, well, okay, let's move on. It's like, oh, Okay, you know, I'm not saying you know maybe some cases are close, but if that one's if that one can go forward, then there's just there's just no there's just nothing. You know, Give so, Ben well, a chance. Well, I mean, we are in the Bay Area, and I think there's some people here who might think excluding all automobiles from the United States would be a good thing, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and, and I came here on an electric scooter, the, so uh, I, I, I win. You know? uh, <laughs> but but I, I think the answer to that is that that the. It, probably is not the case that the exclusive relief that either is sought or available in such a case is excluding all uh, automobiles from the United States. There are, um, there are lesser um, remedies that, that the ITC might be able to craft. And in fact, we've seen in, in recent uh, cases, including there's, a, there's an Apple case, where they didn't restrict the scope of the exclusion order, but they, they, uh, they changed the timing of the, the standard timing um, of the exclusion order. They gave a company a couple more months to design around something that was perceived, at least by them, as a, as a minor um, innovation as opposed to a fundamental one. A question from the audience. A question that, question that relates to um, the public interest issue and basically more open access for the public to ITC proceedings in similar vein that the U.S. courts have far greater open access through uh, being able to read and access um, briefs, filings for the parties. This raises an issue that I'm sure all the panelists can comment on. People go to the ITC because they want to keep their client stuff under wraps and is keeping a confidentiality uh, order you know, versus all the stuff they file in the ITC, is that, a, is that a reason for going to the ITC versus the district court? You know, a strategy option. And does that conflict with public interest? Should the public know what's going on in these proceedings? And should they have greater access to filings? Uh, that, that, that was the issue. Yeah, that was the issue raised by Judge Clevenger on the domestic industry issue. Is that so much of these opinions are shrouded in secrecy? The public needs to know, um, you know, when they can go in and when they can't. Uh, but I'm not sure the existence of a protective order in and of itself is a a compelling factor to go into district court or the ITC. I think there are other factors that tend to play. Yeah, I've never heard it discussed as a, as a big factor, but I agree that it, uh, you know it's another one of these things where it's it's a perilous enterprise to have two uh, to, to have two thing two branches of the government doing the same thing and doing it inconsistently, and they should. <coughs> and so I, I would submit to stop doing the same thing, right? I mean, and that'll solve the problem. Most of these cases will go away, but if you're going to do the same thing, then you ought to do it in the same way. Uh, and that should be about the same level. There are things that, you know, in, in district court litigation that you can't read. Try to follow, try to follow you know, I, I'm following lots of cases in district court, and there's less stuff I'd love to see that gets redacted. So it happens there, too. 
Let me, let me just finish this. So the, the ITC has gone on, instead of just saying, follow the factors in the statute, for some reason they've invented their own set of, uh, their own set of uh, factors that you do in these five page letters. And, and by the way, you know, I, I'm not going to read them all, but try to think about doing these in terms of what would the effect of an exclusion order uh, of x86 based computers be under these factors? And, and, and you have five pages. Uh, that, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, but, but, but on the other hand, these, these factors follow fairly closely the statute, and, and I encourage that. It isn't all about first responders. It's not all about, you know, enforcing IP. There, there, there is a decent effort to sort of address the factors. So, you know, you know, the proposals on this, you know, I pretty much have made them already. Mere patent enforcement is not a factor. Public welfare goes beyond health and safety. Competitive issues in the United States include, you know, think about the, the, the market in which the products compete, but also the upstream and downstream markets. What effect would it have on Best Buy to exclude all x86 computers? What, you know, that kind of thing. And the impact on our economy as a whole should be considered. Uh, the effect on consumers, I mean, the effect on consumers is beyond that your hospital uses x86 computers. I mean, there's a, there's a you know, if you, I was an antitrust litigator for 13 years, and I think about trying to, to put in economic testimony about the effect of excluding all Apple and HP computers, excluding all car, you know, all these giant exclusion orders that are currently being sought. You know, you're going to need some major testimony, and you're, you know, uh, so I would say that you're going to have to drop the five pages, and you're going to have to stop thinking about efficiency only in terms of how fast we get to resolution. The current bias in the ITC, which you saw in the ITC TLA objecting to, oh, no, that'll slow us down. Wait a minute here. Wait a minute. We're going we're gonna to do the kinds of things that the ITC is thinking about doing right now? You know, it takes a while. It takes a little while. We, you know, we can't expect in 18 months to litigate the impact of excluding huge categories of products from the United States. If they want to go down that road, then, then let's go down that road and let's have real testimony and let's have real reports on this that, that really cover the issue. The irony of the five page thing, by the way, is it's very common at the end of an ITC hearing where the judge says, well, how many pages do you think you need? And one side will get up and say, well, I think I need about 800 pages. And the judge will say, are you sure that's enough? And you know, yet, yet when the public interest, the single most important factor when talking about U.S. commercial activity, you're given five, and and, and that same organization is complaining about it. Single or double space? <laughs> single space. It is single space. And we get the mar we push the margins way out. The one thing about eBay, a lot of people are talking about eBay <coughs> and, and the ITC. And what I would say is this: if you if you buy into the sort of Reina approach that this is just another IP litigation firm, which I, let me get, you know, I'll tell you, I don't buy that. But if you do, then you got to follow eBay. If this, is an, if this is IP litigation, the Supreme Court has told us when you get an injunction and when you don't, and you've got to follow eBay. My opinion, this is not an IP litigation forum, and so the ITC should not have to follow eBay. It is appropriate that the ITC does not follow eBay. eBay deals with a, 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 complaint, you know, a plaintiff asserting his rights under the US patent laws in the United States, and you follow eBay for the reasons of very wonderfully written opinion. But if, you, if it's a trade statute, it's not about the, for example, irreparable harm to the complainant. Irreparable harm to the complainant is not only should not be a factor, it should be utterly irrelevant in deciding whether to issue an exclusion order. The issue is, are we protecting a domestic industry and it is in the public interest to do so? And if that's the case, then we have, luckily, we have a statute for that. It's called D1 and it, and it lists the factors and those should be followed. And so there's no need to, to graft eBay into the ITC. Now the practical effect of following those factors, you would have complete alignment with eBay because, you know, if you just play it out in any given case, you're going to find that a company that's not suffering irreparable harm probably doesn't have a strong domestic industry, and it's probably not in the domestic industry, but, but in the public's interest. But that's not the point. The point is, we have a statute we don't need to graft eBay onto, onto the ITC. So, so I, have, I have a question. Maybe this, is, maybe this is for you, Paul, or some of the other panelists. Yeah, I've, talk, I've talked a lot, so I hope I'll... Oh, but it, it ties into um, to some of the things you're, you're discussing. I don't know. I, sitting here, I've heard a lot of um, chicken little, the sky is falling type statements. All automobiles could be excluded, all x86 PCs could be excluded, and so forth. But the practical reality is that the ITC has been around for, what, 80 years? And I don't think that's ever happened. But, but, look, but the practical reality is that this all really, and it, people are saying it's because of eBay. It's not because of eBay. It's because of Unilock that suddenly, if you look at, this, if you look at troll filings in the ITC, 
Charles doesn't like the ITC. Why? No jury, incredibly front end loaded, expensive, lousy venue when you're Eric Spangenberg, right? It doesn't work well. But suddenly when your damages are going to be limited to the incremental value of your patent on chip packaging, suddenly district court ain't looking like such a good place to go. And what the ITC is, it's a big gun. Eric Spangenberg doesn't want, or IV doesn't want, or X2Y doesn't want, or Linux, they don't want an exclusion order. They don't want, what good does that do? They get nothing. They spend a couple million bucks to litigate in the ITC, or they, their lawyers put in that kind of effort. They get an exclusion order and they get bubkis. What they're using the ITC for is to get a gun that they can't get in district court. And so this guy, it hasn't happened in the past. This is a brand new phenomenon. These are okay. cases that have been filed in the last year. <laughs> okay, and in the last 10 minutes, I, I do want to take uh, on that, uh, that point, which um, I think a lot of people, we've all heard some really passionate uh, presentations here today about the ITC. And part of that, I think, arrives from this idea that it is a gun to the head. And a proposal that we're developing right now, Mark Lemley and I, uh, deals with trying to maybe take some of that pressure off by looking at some of the levers that the ITC has to mediate its own authority and perhaps try to tailor the remedy to fit the crime. So that if you are asserting a patent that is a small part of a big product, maybe it isn't appropriate for you to get that entire big product. Maybe there are other ways to, uh, to give some relief but still not give uh, that exclusion order, which does seem to wield a lot of power. And the three particular um, levers that we were discussing, and I'd be interested in hearing some reactions for people, especially if you're in industry, uh, have products that, um, that could be subject to exclusion orders, would these things help kind of relieve some of the pressure? So the first is, um, as Ben already mentioned, the concept of a stay. And the idea here is that the exclusion order is awarded, but its implementation is delayed. And in the Apple HTC case, that was for four months. It allows basically the public then, which would otherwise be without an option anymore, be without his car or whatever, um, in this case, cell phones, to have a period of time when they can continue to use the infringing products until there's, the company is ready to roll out a new model. So there's no interruption in, in service, there's no interruption in terms of the availability of the product, and the company can regroup and kind of evaluate what are our options here. Can we um, kind of come up with a design around that makes sense? Can we, do we think this is such an important technology that it actually Actually, it is important for us to license it. We do want to pay the full value uh, and, and try to avoid the injunction. Um, and we think this is economically efficient because if companies otherwise would just try to do, think about a design around any time they were sued, that would be economically inefficient. Many times the cases don't go to a place where uh, it, their infringement is proven, and so you don't have a lot of wasted effort in design around. So that's one idea, to have a greater use of stays as the ITC has already done in this Apple HTC case, which uh, we were encouraged by. Um, another lever, though, is also the idea of carving out or grandfathering in existing models. And this has been done actually in several cases. And uh, in the Apple HEC case, there was a carve out provision. Uh, I think the biggest one was in the baseband processors case, which has been referred to earlier this, year, uh, this panel already. Um, and the idea there is, again, especially if you have a, uh, a patent that is a small component of a big product, why don't you let the existing products continue to be sold, but then apply it to uh, new models? So again, Again, that the market has time to, time to react, competitors do, um, and you know the kind of surprise, the gotcha factor that you know, guess what, you've already developed this whole platform around this technology um, is basically taken away because you allow the continuing sale of the, the particular products. The final lever that we've identified that might be also a, a way to try to ameliorate the sting of an exclusion order is if you are going to give a stay and you are going to give the uh, complainants or respondents rather time to transition their new practices under the exclusion order should it, it may be possible for there to get some kind of money. In the sense that you often think of the ITC as only being able to award exclusion orders or can't do damages, that's technically true, but there is the possibility of being able to bond the, uh, the, the complainant, the, the respondents during that period of time. Right now, the, the, it's typically for that 60 day period and you need to make sure that it kind of conforms to the statute, but there are bonds, there are also civil penalties that the ITC, and interestingly, looking at the history of the civil penalty provisions, those do incorporate um, a lot of public interest considerations. The ITC has done that in the past. So those may be things also that can be explored. So um, I'm interested in the panel's reactions or anybody else's about whether these types of um, tailoring would be productive. So um, I'll respond to the question, but there seems to be an assumption in a lot of the things that were said on the panel today, as well as the question itself, that, that there is a problem that needs fixing or that 
patent holders um, have too much power in the ITC, and, and a lot of that, I think, has been conveyed through um, terms like, we're, we're talking about guns and firearms. I consider that a loaded term, no pun intended. <laughs> um, we've been talking about trolls. Uh, that's, that, to me, that's a very pejorative term, and not an appropriate one, and not one to which I subscribe. And one of the reasons for that is, I, I see Mark wrinkling his brow, but it, it's, it's a term that's very difficult to define. Um, we would never think of a, an innovative company that came out of Stanford, such as Google, as a troll, would we? But we heard at the beginning of this conference, this year they bought 24,000 patents. They didn't do any of the innovation behind those patents, they just went out and bought them. So has <coughs> Google become a troll by virtue of its acquisition of those patents? Um, I think, you know, my, in my mind, we're, we're, we're talking about economic efficiency. Those are the arguments that are being given for these changes that are being proposed. But, but in my mind, it's economically efficient and entirely appropriate for there to be um, a lack of complete vertical integration in our economy. Um, I, I don't think that um, it's inefficient to have some companies that manufacture things and other companies that invent to allow that manufacturing to occur or that allow that invention to occur by acquiring patents and, and trying to monetize them. It's just fundamentally, I, I don't accept the, the, the premise of, of a lot of the discussion that I've heard today, which is that trolls or non-practicing entities are inherently bad. If you look at the statistics and you see how frequently non-practicing entities have succeeded in litigation relative to practicing entities, the statistics are basically the same. And, and to me, that suggests it's not, it's not an issue of, of patent quality um, I don't think one or the other should have unique access to courts or, or to remedies. I think they should be treated um, equally and be able to litigate on a uh, on a level playing field. So if that my, were the case, two cents. if okay. that were the case, MPEs should go and push for a legislative change to allow the ITC to issue an order on compulsory licensing. What? Well, don't think there's a need if, to do that. If, if, because there. because otherwise they're saying we're going to point the gun at your head and we're going to take all the leverage on a negotiation. But, but there, it's there, was, not. there was a there was a there was a little phrase in there that your whole discussion is hinged on, and that was people who are, who are inventing these things. In every ITC case against HP, and frankly every NPE case, the product that we sell would have been exactly the same if that patentee had never thought about this industry, had never written that patent. The fact is there's this parallel universe of patents being granted, many of which are granted after I started selling this thing, many of which are granted drafting claims to read on this thing that come popping out of the, that come popping out of the PTO. And those patents do nothing to promote innovation or invention in this country. They just are lottery tickets to come and tax our products. And those are the patents that are being asserted by, I, by NPEs and the ITC. And that's why so, that's the problem. Well, Paul, I agree that, that there are some entities like that, um, but I don't think all non-practicing entities fall into that category, and that's why it's inappropriate and, and dangerous, and, and perhaps it's just a shortcut that doesn't get you to the right result when you lump everyone who's a non-practicing entity into the same boat. They're not that's all the same boat. Maybe it's just the ones that sue us. Let's hear from the audience. Let's hear, the last few minutes. Minutes. I'd like to take it off of the uh, our, our whatever you want to call them, good or bad, okay? I don't want to be accused of using pejorative terms. Since you can refer to them as the bad people. <laughs> <laughs> when we use the term extortionist, we got uh, to do no, I, I don't want to go to <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it wasn't Peter. Peter and I agree on that. It's one of the few things we do agree on. However, uh, one thing I didn't hear you say, one of the things that I've seen with ITC litigation, is particularly on the public interest prong, it's a tremendously back-ended uh, process. It doesn't get referred to the APJ. You can't generally move for summary adjudication the way that if the issue is even, if the APJ is even, excuse me, ALJ, is even allowed to uh, comment on the issue. And whether one of the ways to help improve the process, using the example Paul was talking about uh, earlier with, with you know, banning all cars with GPS, is if you allow summary adjudication on that issue, mm -hmm. it's going to take a fairly gutsy administrative law judge to say no cars with GPS can come in the country. Uh, and I think yeah, it would probably be the ITC would be fairly gutsy to say no cars with GPS can come in the country. So have you thought about you know changing some of the ways it handles it? Because otherwise you go spend the millions of dollars on the process with the gun staring at you, which is you know for the party who may be excluded from the country a, you know, a business risk that they may not find tolerable which is part of what's been going on with the ITC, as Paul said. 
Thank yeah, you. That's a great question, and one for the litigators. The temporary exclusion order kind of preliminary um, injunction hearing is allowed in the ITC, but would there be also a space to do a preliminary kind of summary, initial determination on uh, public interest? I absolutely think there should be, and I think that these rule changes move us in the right direction, and now what you need is ALJs who are actually willing to terminate investigations based upon a failure of public interest. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to agree with Paul that you know there's not there's not a statutory change required for this. It's just um, process procedure. And, and rulemaking. I think it should be a threshold showing to, for yeah. standing, just like domestic industry should be. So, yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's not it's not within the statute that it's, it's standing right now. I mean, I would absolutely agree with that. But I think you can do it even without a statutory change yeah. by having ALJs Maybe. who are willing to grant summary termination motions on the issue. Hi, this is Michelle Lee, head of Google, head of patents at Google. I just feel compelled to respond to the comment about um, Google and its need to purchase patents and so forth. <laughs> There has been a lot of messaging as to why the company felt the need to do so, and also I think the company has chimed in on a number of these issues, so um, just want to state for the record that, I mean, there was a whole bunch of reasons why the company felt it needed to do that, <laughs> other than monetization. I, I figured given how much you paid, there were many reasons. <laughs> All right, well, that much, pretty much takes us up for lunch. I hope you guys are, your appetites are whetted by this discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, all the panelists, please join me in thanking them. Thank <laughs> you.